Good afternoon on today's Angry Alien Bulletin. It appears that UFOs are very fond of the ocean. But why? Why would they decide to lurk beneath the waves unless there was some sort of advantage to be gained by doing it? Well, as a matter of fact, NASA is experimenting with a new type of propulsion that involves the use of magnetic fields and ionized fluid. In other words, seawater. And when it's used in the atmosphere, the most ideal shape, the best configuration for maximum aerodynamic performance is a flying saucer. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon, and once again, welcome to another Angry Alien Bulletin. We've been enjoying some space flight content over the last several episodes. Now it's time to get back to UFOs, UAPs, whatever you want to call them, or more specifically, new types of propulsion, bleeding edge propulsion that NASA is actually working on right now that might already be in use by various extraterrestrial civilizations who may be paying us a visit right now. And yeah, perhaps that might seem far-fetched to some of you, but the more I read about these encounters, the more I study these various incidents that are reported by very reliable sources and backed up by military surveillance equipment, radar, etc., the more questions I start to ask about why is all of this taking place, what is the rationale behind the behavior of these craft, and so on. And one thing that I've really wondered is why do they seem to like the water so much? Why do we have so many sightings now taking place off the coastline, either by ships that are on some sort of patrol pattern, and some of these ships equipped with very sophisticated surveillance equipment, as you may remember in the previous episode about UFOs that I did on this channel, and also, of course, events like the Tic Tac UFOs, where there was apparently a larger craft lurking underneath the water, as well as the Tic Tacs zooming along over the waves. Why would UFOs, why would extraterrestrial visitors have an interest in the oceans? Would it be simply because they want to hide there? Are they gathering samples? Are they perhaps collecting sea life for some sort of extraterrestrial zoo? Or might there be something else about the ocean that could be very useful to them? Well, as a matter of fact, yes, very possibly. There is a new type of propulsion. Well, actually, the idea has been around for a very long time, but NASA has just invested some more money in it called magnetohydrodynamic propulsion. And of course, with the hydro in that word, I'm sure you can ascertain that water is involved in this propulsion system. The idea is to use a very powerful magnetic magnetic field to drive an ionized fluid out the back of your ship at a very high velocity in order to achieve thrust. Really, that's not very different from a lot of other different magnetoplasma drives that have been proposed lately. The idea of using some sort of ionized substance and magnetic fields in order to achieve propulsion and achieving very high speeds in the process. And of course, Water, or more specifically, salt water, is a really good place to start because it's already ionized, or rather there's lots of ionized particles in salt water. And that fact takes me back to my sixth grade HATS class that I had. HATS is a gifted and talented program in Colorado in the late 1970s, where we were educated about what conductive materials were and the fact that water Water itself was not actually very conductive, but rather whatever you dissolve in water. Whatever is dissolved oftentimes is broken down into ionized particles. And then once you have an ionized fluid, then you can use the electromagnetic fields in order to achieve propulsion. But interestingly enough, the very same principles that make an MHD drive work could also work in the air. And if you use it this way, 
the most ideal and useful shape, the shape that achieves the best aerodynamic performance, is, interestingly enough, a flying saucer. First of all, a few quick words about these photographs that were allegedly taken by the USS Trepang, I think that's how it's pronounced, SSN 674, on March of 1971. And I found all this stuff in the Black Vault. This is what we know about these photographs so far. Number one, the photos were taken from a United States Navy submarine, allegedly. The location was between Iceland and the Jan Mayan island in the Atlantic Ocean. Jan Mayen apparently belongs to Norway and is only inhabited by the Norwegian Meteorological Institute and the Norwegian military. Apparently the photographs were taken in March of 1971. Once again, the submarine was the Navy's USS Trepang, which is a real submarine, and the Admiral on board was Dean Reynolds Sackett, which we haven't been able to dig anything up on him either. The submarine came upon the object apparently by accident as they were in the region on a joint military and scientific expedition. Officer John Klika was the one who initially spotted the object and photographed it through the periscope. So apparently there was indeed a sailor on that submarine according to U.S. Navy records named John Klika. However, just how authentic the rest of this is, I can't say, and the Black Vault isn't saying either. However, the Pentagon hasn't made any statements about this yet, and if these photographs are part of a hoax, well, it'd be nice to get some confirmation from them, as opposed to silence. But let's move on to magnetohydrodynamic propulsion. As I said before, this type of propulsion has actually been in development for over half a century. Century. The idea of utilizing water as a form of propulsion, or a propellant that is, especially on a submarine so you can get rid of all of those pesky propellers and all the machinery involved and what makes propellers work because those sorts of things can break down quite often and also they create quite a signature beneath the water which sonar can home in on. As a matter of fact, the Caterpillar drive utilized by the fictional Red October submarine in the Tom Clancy novel of the same name utilized a magnohydrodynamic drive to achieve its propulsion. So it's very stealthy as well as being simple and efficient. But in addition to that, it can be used in the air. So let's go ahead and talk about the principles behind electrohydrodynamic propulsion in the air as well, because it works this way beneath the water too. The first step is to ionize the air around the vehicle and that can be achieved by means of high voltage electric arc discharges or perhaps microwaves lasers, radioactive source, something along those lines in order to create an ionized plasma out of the air around the spacecraft. Once the plasma exists, then it flows around the spacecraft by means of the electromagnetic field and the propulsion force results from pressure distribution on the vehicle, just like lift on an aircraft wing. However, given the fact that you have air essentially surrounding surrounding the vehicle as it is passing over it, a saucer-shaped vehicle with essentially a rounded wing provides the best lift and the most efficient use of the airflow. So a flying saucer makes the best use of this type of propulsion, at least in the air. Now this is an external flow MHD drive. There's also an internal flow MHD drive, which utilizes an ionized fluid that that is accelerated within the craft and propelled out a nozzle very much like a conventional rocket engine. But before we get to that, let's talk about the atmospheric use of this drive and the external flow system and some of the side effects that you get. First of all, because it is utilizing the air in such an efficient way and the airflow is reducing the bow shock, this sort of propulsion theoretically could achieve hypersonic velocities without a sonic boom. 
In other words, this would be a very stealthy craft, and also that would explain how UFOs travel at supersonic velocities without a supersonic boom, as have been described by various pilots who have tried to keep up with them. In addition to that, because this is an ionized plasma, this would have the side effect of creating a glow around the spacecraft, especially at night, which would explain why flying saucers are observed as glowing craft when observed at nighttime. All of this just makes way too much sense. We're talking about a mode of propulsion that could achieve supersonic velocities without a supersonic boom, without complicated jet turbines and lots of moving parts, without a tremendous heat signature, and without a whole lot of noise either. But it would have a glowing effect at night very interesting indeed. But it gets even more interesting if you want to talk about space propulsion. So let's go ahead and take this concept out into space as NASA is actually doing right now with an MHD drive that creates breathable atmosphere as well as thrust. Let me explain how this works. First of all, you need to carry a propellant inside your spacecraft. You don't have any air out in space, so you can't manipulate airflow in order to generate lift and velocity like you can do in the atmosphere. That being the case though, you use an ionized fluid and then a very powerful magnetic field to drive that fluid out the back of the spacecraft like a conventional rocket engine. The difference is that ionized fluid is just seawater, nothing else, because it starts out being ionized. You don't need a lot of energy to make it an ionized fluid because it already is once you dissolve salt in seawater. And then once you get your thrust, it also creates a byproduct of hydrogen and oxygen. So you can use the hydrogen in a fusion power plant and the oxygen as breathable atmosphere. And this type of propulsion would generate a considerable amount of thrust along with with lots of specific impulse, whereas conventional rocket engines have a lot of thrust, but not a lot of specific impulse. They run out of fuel very quickly. Not so with this type of propulsion. So in other words, as long as you had an ample supply of seawater for fuel, and of course a substantial amount of energy for the magnetic field, that's the big problem with this type of propulsion. It requires a great deal of energy. Energy. So we're talking about a fusion reactor at the very least, or perhaps an antimatter reactor for something a lot further in the future. But as long as you have the power for the magnetic field, you can get lots of thrust and lots of specific impulse, utilizing nothing more than ionized water or just salt water. Now, when you run out of propellant, you obviously have a problem there, so you need to use your propellant very sparingly out in space. However, you wouldn't necessarily be completely out of fuel because you could also ionize the particles in interplanetary and interstellar space and suck that into your spacecraft with something that's called a bussard ramjet or a bussard scoop to keep going. However, these sorts of particles are few and far between, especially in interstellar space, so you want to gas up with salt water as often as possible, which could explain why these spacecraft are visiting our oceans with such frequency. So there you have it, a propulsion system that works equally well in the water, in the air, and out in space, all with the same principle and with the same type of drive. I would like to thank the following awesome Patreon supporters who have just joined up recently. X Hunter, Lauren A, and Dan, and also Matt Zopp, and Jack Morgan. Thank you so much for your support and helping me climb that hill to get to 1% of my subscribers being Patreon supporters. That will change everything about what I can do on this channel. And in addition to that, there are quite a number of members who also upgraded their memberships. Roger Slytham, 
James Larson, and also Jim and George Irwin. Thank you so much for your support. And if you'd like to join my growing family of supporters and get access to unique and exclusive content and also early release content and also access to my Discord server, which has hundreds of people who are engaged in the spaceflight industry and also UFO enthusiasts, well, all you have to do is check out the description. So until next time, I urge all of you, to stay angry about space.